So welcome to Auntie Sue's Pandemic Kitchen. And today uh, we're going to talk about grief and gratitude and how we sniff our way through along that path, how we use our um, sense um, our sense of smell, our ability to learn, and how we develop that kind of a practice to deal with gratitude. I mean, to deal with, deal with grief. Gratitude is the antidote to grief in many ways. So um, we're all facing a lot of losses, um, losses of people, losses of friends, um, loss of money, and loss of control, and that sense of control. And we all want to believe and we all do believe that those things are, are with us and yet that is an illusion. And so what we've also had ripped away is the illusion. So when I studied at Harvard Divinity School, I didn't really take too many courses in the field, in the area of Buddhism, but I did manage to pick up along the way um, that that is a Buddhist practice, is the understanding that uh, coming to terms with the fact that almost everything that we are attached to is illusion. And, um, and we certainly have had that illusion ripped away from us during this uh, virus, and that, and that often leads to grief. So <clears throat> what are we going to do about that? Um, and that's the practice of gratitude, that antidote to grief. Um, we talk about people who have grace under pressure. A lot of G's here. Grace under pressure. Uh, and that is also um, something that comes from being able to not only take in the grief, but also to then be able to um, feel it and process it and, and, and um, work with it. And gratitude, I think, is one of the, the techniques that we, we do that with. So what we're going to be talking about a little bit today is the making of a gratitude list and the using of the gratitude list to help us process um, grieving. One of the things that was really interesting in um, one of the books that I referenced and, and read when I was writing Sustainable Health was one called Altered Traits, which was written by two um, psychologists um, both of whom they met and trained at Harvard. Um, and one of them is a professor, I believe, there, and the other one is, um, has gone into another area of, um, of psychology. Um, and he's a journalist, a psychology journalist. Anyhow, they had gone to, this was in the early 70s, and they had gone to India to study um, meditation and had become very enamored with it and realized that it made a big change in their lives. So they came back to Harvard and said, we want to write our doctoral dissertations on meditation. And Harvard had just seen the back of Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary and the whole LSD thing. And they said, if you even mention the word meditation, it will be the end of your psychology career. So they studied attention for 20 years until it finally became possible for them to talk about meditation again. But one of the things that they found is that when they did all sorts of really intricate um, experiments with, with people who had, um, generally these are, I think, uh, primarily Buddhist um, monks who had been meditating for, um, for decades and meditating a lot, a lot. So they had about 10,000 hours of meditation time under their belts. And those, when they, um, when they felt pain or when they felt anything at all, they felt it much more deeply than the normal, the, you know, than the control subjects who hadn't meditated or who hadn't meditated as long as they had. Um, so they felt it more deeply and they let go of it very rapidly. So that's the key is, is, is to feel it and to let go of it. And, and if you haven't got the time to put 10,000 hours worth of time into meditation, um, a gratitude list is, is, can be a helpful. So I always approach these things by thinking in terms first of the body, then the mind and the spirit. And so in terms of um, the body or in, in terms of the material world, um, in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, grief is represented or resonates with the same frequency as metal. And most of the other traditions have 
um, earth, air, fire, and water. But Chinese medicine has a fifth element, which is metal. And metal, when we think about metal, and specifically gold is the metal that they really reference to it. When we think about metal, uh, it is, um, it is, pure in many ways, you know, when we think about gold or when we think about crystals, those are pure elements. And metal comes to us from the stars and actually all of the elements, um, or almost all of the elements on the periodic table came from the Big Bang and came to, you know, so we're basically all made of stardust um, and sunshine. Um, we get the sunshine from the wood because the, the plants, you know, breathe in this, they eat sunshine actually, and they give mm. sugar and they give us oxygen. And um, so we talked about letting go with, with <clears throat> anger in the same way um, we're talking about letting go with grief, but it's a very different kind of letting go with, with grief than, it, than the one with wood. So um, we'll talk some more about that. But when we think about metal, those are also the substances we use to make jute tools and the things we may use to make jewelry. So um, metal is about, um, is about using that, that element and, and uh, to a certain extent, perfection and purity. Um, and, the, and the organs that resonate with metal are our lungs and colon. So we have um, if you think about what they do, so the lungs take in the air, purify it, and release carbon dioxide. The colon um, receives all of the food, purifies it in a sense, and sends what's not pure out the back door, basically. And that is um, the job of the, of the colon. So is to take in everything from outside and, and distill it into its purest essence. And so um, uh, that is, is one of the, the functions. And the other, um, the tissue, the body tissue that resonates with metal is our skin. So skin is also very protective uh, and it is also um, just like the colon, one of the first lines of defense in our immune system. Uh, protecting us from what comes in. And so this is an important, because this virus is so deeply affecting our lungs, um, and, and, it, and this is where we see the symptoms, uh, coming to terms with grief is a very important piece of what we do emotionally to make ourselves resilient and resistant to the virus. So, um, and again, the skin, you know, they talk about washing the hands. Of course, washing the hands is very important. And in fact, before we had uh, the use of surgical gloves, um, that was indeed what, what most medical practitioners did, relied on was the washing of hands. Um, their hands in between patients and that kind of thing. And it was only when, when AIDS came along and um, because of they kept that confidential um, in, in medical records, you had to assume that everyone you treated had AIDS. So you had to protect yourself from the blood products. And that's when the use of gloves really became standard mm -hmm. practice in any healthcare facility. I happened to be around during that time. So I remember when we <clears throat> made that switch. Me too. Michelle does too, yes. Oh, yeah. And, um, so um, the masks also, are, again, are protecting us from the taking in of that, another line of defense before we rely on the body to do it. But our lungs and our colon and our skin are, are very, very important pieces of our immune system and our ability to, um, to resist um, not just this virus, but any all different kinds of um, external uh, pathogens. And dryness is is one of, is is the enemy, if you will, of, of metal. Um, uh, and so the skin needs to stay moisturized. So when you wash your hands, be aware that you will um, that you will uh, dry out the skin, and the skin needs moisture to do its job. So moisturize, moisturize, and thank you to Tamer for that shea butter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, so, um, so that's, um, that takes care of our, 
um, of the body of the material world. And then next we go to the mind and the mind is the storyteller. Our minds will make up stuff to make, you know, it helps us remember things, uh, but the mind makes stuff up. And, uh, and the mind is the one that calls, to per 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 calls for perfection. Not in everybody, but I happen to be one of those people that suffers from perfectionism. And, uh, and black and white thinking comes along with that perfectionism. You know, see, you've got the black and white on today. And I do indeed have issues that affect my lungs. I do indeed have issues that affect my skin. Uh, and, um, and, and grief is an issue, um, emotional issue for me to deal with. Uh, and the letting go of that perfectionism. And actually, Michelle and I did some nice rituals when she was visiting here. Um, she usually comes to New York for uh, Christmas, New Year's time, and we got to spend some time, and um, that was wonderful. And I, um, I actually put a little, see my little nose ring, a little metal stud in the, in the nose, again, to remember, <laughs> um, to remember to let go, to remember to let go. So we learn with the mind. Um, we learn. Um, we learn to coordinate. Coordination is any uh, anything, any skilled activity that we do. We've learned with our hands or our legs, or our feet. But because our skin covers all parts of our body, it actually is what teaches us how to coordinate. Because all of the nerve endings that there's so many different nerve endings in our skin that can sense pressure, that can sense um, stretching, that can sense all kinds of um, input. And those um, sensory organs are what enable us to learn skilled movement. So, uh, and the way you learn skilled movement, just like the way you learn meditation is practice, practice, practice. So this is, and this is the, um, this is another, piece of this so this having to um, practice and smell actually um, although we don't pay a lot of attention to it in in this um, in our culture uh, we do have the ability um, within our genetic system uh, because we know that there are other humans around the globe who can have very very distinct senses of smell uh, from perfumers who um, combine different things together in certain ways to people who are still hunting who can smell um, from 20 feet away and differentiate the smell of urine with, from what, what they're hunting versus what's hunting them, which is an important piece. And I remember hunting, uh, hiking in the Grand Canyon at, at some point and going down the trail and all of a sudden smelling that really strong, you know, um, cat urine. Oh, yeah. And knowing that it probably wasn't a house cat. Probably not. <laughs> and, and, and feeling very hopeful that I wouldn't encounter <laughs> whatever it was that was making that, that, um, making that smell. So we learn from smell, and smell is really interesting because it goes right into the part of our brain that coordinates memories with um, emotions and also with what's going on in our guts. So... Uh, and so smell is a really important way of learning and aromatherapists use that as well. So when we, when we learn through practice, um, and our memories that we gain through experience and practice are somewhat different than the memories we have that are more, um, uh, genetic memory, which we also have, um, but our, our experience memories. Uh, are linked to this metal and to this practice. And yet, um, oftentimes we may know something without actually taking, because that smell goes right into that part of the brain, we actually can have an intuitive um, response to things simply based on that smell and recognizing that smell from before. I worked with a teacher in, um, actually she wasn't a teacher, she was an administrator in the Tucson Unified School District, and she trained to be a teacher. And then the first time she walked into a school to do her student teaching, she couldn't tolerate the smell. So if people have had a bad, ex schools have a particular smell no matter where you go. 
they have, you walk into them and that's the smell. Uh, and she had, that's how she became an administrator because she, <laughs> she did not work in, in the school because um, she had too many negative associations apparently with that, that smell. So this is something that um, we may not ever, it may never ever go to our conscious pathways because it goes right in to um, the part of our bodies that protects us and the part of our bodies um, that holds those memories for us. So, um, so grief also comes along with this and that's the spirit part of this. Um, grief is um, the emotion that's associated with metal and if you think about um, what happens to us as we, you know, we all experience anger, we all experience um, uh, fear uh, and anxiety, but we also all experience grief. And the way we experience grief is through the loss of something. And it starts, you know, at childhood, it starts sometimes for, for some um, people as, uh, even in infancy. Um, but we all talk about the purity of childhood and the purity uh, and the innocence of children and innocence of babies. And, and the emotion that they haven't experienced is grief because mm. they haven't lost. But very quickly, you know, you lose a toy. Um, um, people tell you, you know, there's betrayals, various things. And so each one of those, if you will, sort of tarnishes that shiny bright um, soul that we are born with uh, and we have to learn how to polish those tarnishes out we have to learn how um, to do that and and for people who have um, uh, who have gone through tremendous losses and come out the other side uh, they have learned how to do that so they they have that um, they felt that but they managed to to polish it and to, um, to come out the other side. There's a wonderful book that I um, read uh, called um, The Nine uh, Happiness, not that I can't remember the title of it, but nine, um, The Nine Steps to Happiness. And this were these two guys that decided to go around the country interviewing the happiest people. They would go into a town and say, who's the happiest person in your town? And what they found <laughs> was, and they would go interview them. <laughs> And found a lot of people drinking. <laughs> um, what they found actually was a lot of the people had been through tremendous losses. Mm -hmm. Come out the other wow. side and managed to um, do that. And one of the one of the story they had a wonderful stories. The book's just full of wonderful stories. But one of the guys that I um, that one of the stories I remember was a a man who um, he and his family they had lost a child. The child had been killed, or I can't remember what happened, but the child had died, and in in a uh, I think it may you know may have been a very traumatic way. Um, I don't remember exactly how, but he was very depressed, and everybody in the family was of course very depressed. And one day he said to himself, "Gosh, you know, I go out and I bring money into this household. I need to go out and bring happiness." And he made it, he made it a practice to do that. And, and now, you know, and then, you know, 10 years later, when they met him, he was the happiest man in that town, um, identified in that way. And, and he, um, and yet he could still cry about the loss of that child. So he hadn't, he hadn't forgotten about it or wiped it away, but he had made it part of, you know, polished it and made it part of who he was in a way um, that, um, is that's the grace that's the grace under pressure that we like that we like to think about and again um you know we we have the diaphragm and below the diaphragm is all the messy stuff the guts are all in there and above the diaphragm we have the heart and the lungs so we'll talk some more about the heart and and love and joy next week but the heart and the lungs are kind of like the the upper chamber the pure the where purity is uh, and the guts and the and the um, the gallbladder and the liver, the spleen and the stomach, um, the um, kidneys and the bladder, they're all below the diaphragm. They all deal with the messy stuff. And, <clears throat> and except for the bladder, which sends it out the front door, 
the rest, the rest of those organs send it out the back door. So that's where all the messy stuff is. And I, I went to a wonderful workshop once with um, a woman named, um, I can't remember her name, um, Thea, um, Thea Elijah. Thea Elijah. Marsha helped me out in the other room. Thea Elijah. And she is a wonderful um, acupuncturist uh, and a psychotherapist in Vermont. And she wears these crazy costumes and she's just very funny and very wonderful. But she was talking, I was talking to her right after the, or she was doing a workshop about the, that, you know, the heart and the lungs versus the, you know, the messy, the messier emotions. Um, grief and joy live up here. Uh, fear, anger, and anxiety live down below the diaphragm. And she was talking about that messiness. And it was right after the Kavanaugh hearings. And she said, so, you know, whatever side of the aisle you were on that, what would we do if we took all of that that happened in that those hearings and we were to take it and purify out all that was messy and send that out the back door, how, what would be left? And what she said was justice and compassion. Mm. And that's, that's that, that, that um, sense of doing that. So um, because the metal is both the lungs and the colon, that's exactly that dichotomy. How do we get there? How do we let go um, wood energy, yeah. anger, we let go fearlessly. You know, that's the tantrum, having the tantrum. So first we scream and holler, and then we cry in, when we do an emotional cleanse. And so the tears are what cleanse. The tears are where we are able to let go with grief. So we let go um, with, with shouting, with anger, but we let go with tears. Um, with with grief we let go of fear by complaining and moaning we let go with tears so tears getting those tears out and practicing getting those tears out um is a really good practice um not easy um but you don't have to be an actor to do it you can you can do it um and um giving ourselves permission to do that because from childhood most of us are taught not to cry we're taught um to um <clears throat> um save things for a rainy day and and we end up with a house full of useless junk and um you know hearts that get hardened by the griefs that we never let go of so those are um two things that can happen that we want to avoid and particularly in this time period um those of us who have lost people or who know people who have lost people that time to grieve and that time to cry is very important and then we begin to look at what it is that we have that's left behind when i read tarot cards the five of cups i believe the cups are emotions um the five of cups uh in the traditional tarot doc that i have and in in variations in other decks there's always spilled stuff in front so you're looking at this what's been lost in front of you but always behind you, there's something valuable. So there's two full cups behind you and then the spilled cups in the front of you. We have to take that moment to look at what we still have and what, what it is. And that's the gratitude practice. That's the practice that enables us to get beyond grief and um, not to, to forget about it, but to get beyond it and say, what is it that we are grateful for? And I recommend that you try for this week um, a gratitude practice if you don't already do one. I like to do mine before I get out of bed in the morning. And there's a really good reason for that. And that is that metal energies uh, in the traditional Chinese medicine, all of the um, elements have a certain time of day that they are essentially on watch. They're like, mm. that's their, their time to be um, on watch. And the time for metal energy is between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. So even if you're sleeping in because of the quarantine, which many of us are, or even if you regularly sleep in, there's still that time before you get out of bed when you're still under the protection of the metal energy, so to speak. And that's the best time to do this gratitude list and to, to take that. So you may wake up and, and you know, sometimes feel loss and feel sadness, 
But if you can feel that and when you get to the other side of it, then say to yourself, what am I grateful for? And I always like to use my hand because it's easy to count off my hand five things before I get out of bed. And I also, when I look at my hand, look at wood, you know, wood, look at, actually this is metal, um, but wood, water, air, I mean, wood, um, water, uh, earth, and fire. So um, I'm gonna, the first thing I'm gonna be grateful for every morning is that I can still breathe the air. And that's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing if my lungs are clear and I can breathe easily. It's a good thing. I live in New York that they're, you know, I'm not breathing in anything that's toxic or at least not uh, uh, overwhelmingly toxic. And there are so many parts of the world where people are having to breathe air that not only is toxic, but smells toxic. Um, so being grateful for that, like the air that I breathe is so important and it comes from the trees that are around me. So I'm always grateful for that air. Yeah. Melinda, you have a, I have a question or I can wait till the end either way. I, I, I don't now. want to interrupt. You're on a good thing. Well, okay. I, I do my grateful thing, but I, I do it in the evening when I'm calming my mind and going to sleep. So it's not in the morning. You can Should do I? it both times. You can do it any time of day or night, really. But, um, and, and there's reasons, you know, there's different things going on elementally in the evening, but um, that make it a good time as well. But um, so I do, I'm, first thing I'm grateful for is the air that I breathe, the wood energy. The second thing is the water energy. And, you know, I live in a house where I can walk into several rooms and turn a tap and water comes out. Isn't that a marvelous thing? It is a marvelous thing. And not only is there cold water, but there's hot water. Almost all the time. I got cold water, I got hot water, and I can drink it. I mean, I filter my water and stuff, but I don't have to. I could do very well in, in the city. We are very fortunate in New York City to have the clean water that we have. And I know, particularly in West Virginia, that is not the case for a lot of that state. And um, it's a very, you know, if you live in Flint, Michigan, it's not the case, but I am grateful every day for that. And when I think about being able to turn on and off hot and cold water and have it run out of my tap, King Louis the 15th or 14th, whoever the sun king was, he would have killed his grandmother for that. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> live like coming. royalty. We live better than royalty. And, and, and having that water is one of those things. So I'm always grateful for that. Then I think about my earth energies and I think about food and I, you know, my refrigerator is full of food and my cupboards are full of food and I'm not worried about my next meal. I mean, I, mean, I can think about it like, oh, are we gonna have the pot roast tonight or chicken or, you know, do I just go to the store with my mask on, whatever. But there's food and I have it. So there's three things right off the bat that I can be grateful for. And then um, when I go to the next energy, which is the metal energy, um, I can be thankful for the work that I do. I can be thankful for the, um, my health, uh, my ability to breathe in and out. Uh, I can be thankful um, for um, the house that I live in, the tools that I have. There's so many different things that, that are that metal energy. And then fire energy, which is what we'll talk about next week, is, is the heart and our relationships. And so I'm thankful for my wife almost every day. Um, at, almost. Know, morning, oh. At night, maybe not so much. But in the morning, I'm thankful for my dogs. <laughs> I'm thankful for um, my, um, she's laughing in the other room, I hope. Um, <laughs> she is laughing, I can hear. The dog or the wife? The wife. <laughs> the, dogs, the dogs, yeah, they laugh too. Um, and so, um, like my dogs and my family, my friends, there's so many people and relationships to be thankful for in my life. So, you know, once you get on a roll in the gratitude list, you can just keep building and building and building. And I like to, you know, those are the five elements that I use to sort of organize and structure and, and do that. And one other thing, because the nose and the, is a part of this element, um, when we let go, when we let go of grief, um, we do it with, um, oftentimes with, with shouting and that's that, that wood energy. But think about your dogs, those of you who have dogs, you know when they get frustrated with you, they always sneeze. 
Have you noticed that? They'll like, and with each other's, they'll sneeze. It's like, that's another great way to get rid of that kind of energy. And in the morning, oftentimes we will, um, you know, our noses are runny. We're getting rid of, getting rid of toxins. So um, trust, you know, having trust in our bodies and, 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 you know, we talked about faith. We talked about um, uh, uh, the, the forgiveness with the, with the wood energy. And this is our chance to be grateful and gratitude. And that will get us through the grief and help us move into um, bringing that energy into, into, our, um, into, our, into our hearts. So that's what we want to do. We want to let go of grief and breathe easy. And especially during these times. And that's what I have to share today. And so if anybody's got comments or questions, um, I'd be happy to have it. Okay, Heidi, I see your little hand up. All the teachers know how to make the little hand. I was, I was applauding you. Oh, Bella, I think I know, to, raise, Nancy. to raise a hand, I go into participants, right? And I hit raise hand. I don't know. I just have people. Or that, it's yeah. easier. But yeah, I know, I know that the, the people who are using the Zoom with kids seem to have a better handle on that than, than I have yet. Roberta, you got a comment or a question? Yeah, I just want to add uh, one of the things that keeps me sane besides the gratitude and my cats is laughter. It's so yeah. important for me to laugh, you know, to put on a comedy, even comedies that I've seen before, I know I'm going to laugh at it like Mrs. Doubtfire. You know, yeah. just oh, yeah, I just need a guarantee or calling people that I know are going to make me laugh, like my cousin Bert. Right. Um, you know, I just need to laugh. I, that that whole sensation in my trunk of laughter, you know, it makes me feel We'll be talking really about good. that next week. We'll be talking about that next week because that's fire energy. But when we, and laughter definitely takes us there. But we do need to give ourselves that space to have the grief, to have the tears, and to do that as well. But laughter is definitely, and that's where we're gonna, that's where we're gonna um, go next week. And then um, I'm, I'm probably gonna be here in New York next week, but I might be in Maine. I'm probably gonna be here. But we, so I've gone through all five of the elements um, by next week. So I want people, if you, you know, want me to do some more of these, uh, classes, you want to do some more pandemic kitchens, like what kinds of health issues, what kinds of emotional issues, what kinds of things you might be interested in. And, and I can take this, I can take this forever. I'm, you know, with that kind of stuff. Um, so thinking about that going forward. Yeah. Tara. Um, Okay, there, I had to unmute myself. Um, do you, uh, Kay had mentioned composting, and she lives in Maine, and, oops, hello? Here, you're still here. Everything disappeared, but you can hear me, so that's good. You yes. can hear you. I'm wondering if you know how to compost at home. I do, but I'm going to let Kay tell you, because they, she and my brother have more composting tricks up their sleeve than anybody I know. So, okay, do you want to tell them all the things that you compost and wear in your house? Hmm. Well, I can tell you honestly that I've gone to only composting my yard waste right now. So that's what I was turning over today. I've actually enlisted a, a service for curbside compost pickup that you pay like nine bucks a month for or something. They pick up your compost bucket every week, which is really nice. And then they tell you where you can go and get some finished compost. So you're not the muscle that's turning it over every time. And yeah, so that's one really great way to compost because if you're in any kind of town or urban area, they're starting to be available for almost all of us now. Um, we have it here in New York City. Um, yeah. They're going to take it away. Is that why you're asking, Tara? They're going to stop it, yeah. Yeah, they're going to stop it. Temporarily. Oh. Temporarily. I'm really uh, temporarily. posting inside so, my apartment. Like, uh, the church uh, pipe, but with, like, worms or something. Or with, okay, so there's a you book guys have done the worms. Eat my garbage. And mm -hmm. the, the book called Worms Eat My Garbage uh, will tell you how to make a worm farm in your kitchen that doesn't smell. Okay. And, and you've done it, right? You guys did it for a while. Yeah. Yep. Harold did that. Yeah. 
It's and funny. Why did, why did you stop? stop? The worms died. We don't know what happened to them. We felt bad. We, you know, we were like, oh God, we killed our worms. We don't know why. But we had it for a couple of years and throwing things in there all the time. I don't think we gave it enough attention. Enough. Sing to the worms, Terry. Yeah, you didn't <laughs> say <laughs> Yeah, because we were a couple of two and we, yeah. So you got to feed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, feeding them is important too, yeah. I also, Great. I guess you have to, compost. you have to reduce the population maybe by taking some of them out into the garden. At some point you do need to take some worms out as long as you want. Yeah. You guys have also grown um, mushrooms on your coffee grounds too, right? Yep, there's a way you can grow that. Were they edible? Oh, yeah. yeah, edible as any mushroom. Yeah. The only yeah. mushrooms you don't want to eat is mushrooms that have grown on toxic waste because they pull that, they will pull the toxins right out of the soil. But if you're uh -huh. drinking coffee, you know, they're, you don't have to worry about that. But tell them about the, do you remember how you did the coffee? Are you still growing the mushrooms under there or? No, we did one batch. You have to first create mycelium, and so you get the spores, and you put it with uh, layers of newspaper, I think. Mm. And you, you make a little container with layers of the uh, spores. Uh, you can actually use already mushrooms. Like, go to the store, buy some oyster mushrooms, chop them up, put them in layers in your, in your little container with wet um, newspaper or some material like that, stick it under your sink for a couple of weeks and then take it out and it's all white. Ha! Ah, it's all white, it's mycelium. And then you take that mycelium and you layer that with your coffee grounds and that will produce the mushrooms. Wow. That's an oversimplified explanation. There's, you Google the better in instructions. And you, can, and you can actually, at least I think Harold was telling me, you can actually get the mushrooms, just cut the bottom end, the sort of the root, it's not exactly a root, it's mycelium. Mm -hmm. But because um, mushrooms come from outer space or who knows what, the mushrooms are like the, the puzzle in the in the biology, you know, thing. But um, but you cut those that root the root piece off, and you um, you use that to make the mycelium, and you can actually eat the mushrooms. So you get the best of both worlds. You get your yeah. mushroom, and you get to eat it too. Yeah. <laughs> make your mycelium and eat your mushroom too. So it's good. It's a good deal. So Tara did, I got something going on. Hopefully we didn't give you too much information, but there's a lot of really cool stuff like that that you can do. I, I've read about it, but I knew that you and Harold had actually done some of that. Has anybody here done, Terry Brown, have you done that kind of composting? I, I'm not great at composting. I have done a little bit of mushroom, but usually for the mushrooms, we just go out on walks because we're in West by God, Virginia. And they go a lot of places. Great. And, and you know, know where what they you're are. Picking. So, yeah. Yeah. We get, well, we get chicken of the woods. Morels are right now. Chanterelles will be coming up soon. Wow. Uh, That's so oysters great. Oysters are always fun. We do a fair amount of mushroom hunting. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Hey, Susan, um, I wonder if you could do a episode, whatever you call it, on uh, sprouting. Okay, that's making little sprouts. sprouts. We could do sprouts. That'll be good. That would be the wood energy coming back around after we finish this set. Okay, so I might take a week off. Well, if I'm going to Maine, if I have an order. yeah. Um, but then we'll start with sprouting. That would be really good, and that's a great way. When I'm I'm thinking about working on a book on sustainable healing and and going, you know, so I did sustainable heath transforming simple habits to transform your your life, and then. I um, am working on um, the sustainable healing, which is transforming the world. And one of the things is is growing. Okay, now we've got two Taras. Taras. Yeah. Anyway, hi Tara, you're back. Hopefully, we didn't give you too much information um, about composting. But pretty much, we were done by the time you disappeared. I think. So um, let's see. Um, so we'll work on some sprouting. Um, anything else? Are we? Yeah. Okay. It looks like everybody's got their questions answers. It's so wonderful for me. I so appreciate all of you coming every week. I look forward to it. Too. Good. So Especially with you. 
without a lot too. going on i mean yeah, i yeah. don't go to work i don't see it i mean i still see plenty of people i go for an hour walk every morning and i just went to the grocery store today so it's not that i'm isolated but i look forward to our time together yeah it's really nice i enjoy it too so well um thank you all for coming today and um i um i appreciate it and I um, will look forward to next week and we'll talk about laughter and joy and, and how to keep our hearts healthy. So, <laughs> all right. So, thank you, Susan. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Send me that email. <laughs> okay. Which email? No, Tara was going to send me an email for oh, an oh, okay. online right. dance thing, like a Zoom dance okay. thing. All it's right. supposed to begin now. Okay. Excellent. I don't know if she heard me or not. <laughs>